بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد النبي الامي وعلى اله وسلم تسليما our next shining star had firoz ad-dalmi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu as you can tell by his name he was not an arab he was persian and he was one of the people who we talked about a couple of shining stars back when we were talking about Abdullah bin Hudhafa radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and that he went to Kisra the emperor of Persia and the emperor of Persia sent a letter to his governor in the state of Yemen to send two men to the blessed prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to arrest him naudhu billah and bring him to Persia those two men came the person who sent them from yemen his name was badam or badan he was from the abna he sent these two men they came to medina munawwara rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he saw them he turned his face away from them they came towards him the second time he turned his face again this happened three times and i mentioned that in a lot of detail the governor his name was Badam he was from the abna and under that i was mentioning that there is a sahabi that we're going to talk about who's going to be one of our shining stars who is from the abna and inshallah on that occasion i'll mention who the abna are abna actually means the sons the sons but in reality these are persians who lived in yemen and were born and raised in yemen though by descent they were persian they faced an issue when they accepted islam and the issue is something very similar to many of us may face children of immigrants who are born and raised here maybe in the united states whose parents are from originally from somewhere else you see the abna they were born and raised in yemen so they spoke arabic they dreamed in arabic and their culture that they had grown up in was all arab but at the same time they weren't arab at all they were persian so when they accepted islam the persians wanted nothing to do with them and at the same time since they were not originally yemen the yemenis didn't want anything to do with them either they spoke their language and they adopted that culture but they weren't yemeni so they were kind of stuck between both so firoz ad-dalmi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was one of the abna and that's why there's a narration that comes about him that he came to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a delegation from the abna who governed all of, over all of the yemen so he came in that delegation to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when he presented him in front of he presented himself in front of the blessed prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he narrates that i said ya rasulullah nahnu mimman qad alam alimta we are from those whom you know wa kharajna min haythu ta'lam and we have come out from that place which you know in other words our descent is our is persian we are persian origin and i've come from yemen and i'm not a native yemen but i'm from yemen wa sirna haythu qad alimta and we have become what you know or muslim have accepted islam so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said antum minna you are from among us you are neither persian you are neither yemeni you are just muslim you are a believer and so you are from among us and as i mentioned yesterday rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would become a guardian of those people who would not have any connections because of accepting islam for example uh, yesterday we talked about saad 
he was disconnected from his uh, tribe because once he accepted Islam, Banu Sulaim, his tribe had not. He settled in Medina Munawwara, he was all alone, nobody would take care of him, and nobody who would give their daughter to him. So Rasulullah took that responsibility. Likewise, any other person, because of whatever reason, was ostracized by his tribe, by his people, by the place where he was, Rasulullah would take charge of him. Firoz ad radiallahu is another one of those people. He was not a, in the same situation as Sa'ad al-Aswad in that he did not have any family behind him or that he did not have a tribe or that people didn't like him because of the way he looked. He was very powerful. He was from the Abna. He was from the governing powers in Yemen. But at the same time, because he accepted Islam, the Persians didn't want anything to do with him. And at the same time, because he was not native Yemen, he was not originally from Yemen. Therefore, the Yemenis didn't want anything to do with him. So he was really nowhere. So Rasulullah said that, Antum minna, you are from among us. When Firoz al-Dalimi came to Rasulullah and accepted Islam, he faced a very big situation because his primary uh, way and source of making money was vineyards. He owned a lot of grape vineyards. And he sold grape, he made wine alcohol, and he sold that too, and he made a lot of money. But once he accepted Islam, not all that had to go. So his, all, his whole income, source of income, had to go. Imagine the type of sacrifice that he'd have to make, saying that once you've accepted Islam, that now you, this income, the source of income that you have is not permissible. You have to leave it and get into something else. So this is mentioned in the narrations as well. He said, I came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, نَحْنُ مِمَّنْ قَدْ عَلِمْتَ أَنَّا أَصْحَابَ كَرَمْ He said, you know who we are. We are the men of the grapes or the vineyards. We own a lot of uh, vineyards and this is our main source of income. And we have found out that in Islam, you cannot sell alcohol, wine, and you can't do this business. So what do we do? What do we do? Rasulullah sallallahu said, don't make wine, alcohol. The vineyards you have, you have grapes in it. Make them dry and make uh, raisins. Taj'alunahu zabiba. Sell raisins. No harm in selling raisins. He said, okay. We, we, he didn't get the point. But then he said, yes, Allah. What do we do with the raisins then? Manas now bis zabib. What do we do with the raisins? He said that you put it in your water overnight, in the day, and at night you can drink it. You'll have yourself a juice. That's what Arabs used to do when they wanted to make juice they didn't have you know those mix ready-made mixes that we have now that you just mix it with the water and you got juice what they would do is they would have dates they would put it in water in the day and at night when it was very hot the dates would mix with the water the sweetness would come out of it and they would have like a juice sometimes they did that with grapes sometimes they did that with raisins so Rasulullah was telling him put the raisins in the water and night comes you can use that, you can make juice, and you can sell juice if you want. You can drink the juice, do whatever you want. He said, Ya Rasulullah, is it okay if we just wait a little longer after putting the raisins inside the water until it ferments? In other words, until it becomes alcohol? But Rasulullah said, La, no, you can't do this. This is something you can't do. That's haram. Yes, in the winter if you want, you can do so. If you do that in the summer, it will ferment. But if you do it in the winter, and you keep the raisin in the water long enough, it will turn into vinegar. Then you can sell the vinegar if you want. That's, there's no harm in that. So this is one thing that's mentioned about Firoz al-Dalimi radiallahu ta'ala. Eventually, obviously, he left everything. And he sold all these Another thing that's mentioned about him 
is that he was the slayer of the second big false prophet who came into Arabia. There's two of them. One was Musaylama Kadhab from the tribe of Banu Hanifa. The person who killed him was one of our shining stars, Wahshi ibn Harb, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Second person was Aswad al-Anasi. His real name was Abhala ibn Ka'ab from Yemen. And Firoz al-Dalimi radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the one who slayed him. He made the claim to prophethood. This, uh, this Aswad al-Anasi shortly before Rasulullah passed away. And the day Firoz ad dalimi killed him was the last day before Rasulullah passed away. The last day. Just a few hours before he passed away. And obviously in those times they didn't have that type of communication that you would, something would happen and you'd get information about it right away. But Rasulullah was informed through revelation right after he was killed that Aswad Anasi has been killed. So his words were, and he then narrated it to everyone, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, uh, Aswad Anasi has been killed, Qatalahu Abdu Salih. The Aswad Anasi has been killed, and the person who killed him is a very pious man. The pious man, Firoz ad killed him. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was very, very happy. And once finally the letter came that informed that he had been killed, by that time Rasulullah sallallahu had already been, had passed away and he was already in his grave. And at that time the Khilafat of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala had started. So this was a miracle. And, but the thing is that the words that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi used in praise of Firoz ad dalimi radiallahu ta'ala anhu was Qatalahu Abdul Salih. Firoz ad very, very beautiful words coming from the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the pious man, the pious man who Firoz ad has killed him. The Sahaba were very, very happy. Aswad Anasi, there's accounts in history of how Firoz ad killed him. And I want to, inshallah, just narrate that very briefly. And then we'll be finished with our discussion on Firoz ad dalimi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Aswad Anasi, in comparison to Musaylim al-Kadhab, was much, much more dangerous because he used to practice witchcraft. And he had this special way that anybody who came to him, when he would start talking to them, somehow he was able to take over their hearts and they would immediately accept his prophethood. He had this special thing about him. It was his magic and this evil around him, which is mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah that is called istidraj. Istidraj is a term that's used for people who are extremely evil they have a special way of pulling people towards them, a special power. This power is called istidraj. Prophets of Allah also have a certain power that when people come to them, they get attracted to them and they see their beauty. That's called karama or mu'jizah, a miracle. But that same power when it's in the hands of somebody who's extremely evil like Dajjal, then it's called Istidraj. That's why our scholars always mention, always mention, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us, that when there's a person of evil, he's very powerful, don't have the confidence in yourself that you think you can beat him and that you can confront him. Because the likelihood is when you go into his gatherings, you go into his presence, he will be able to spellbind you with his words and with the evil that he's been given. The evil that he has been given by shaitan. 
to pull you into his den, his, lot, his, his, his web, and turn you away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We had one scholar, Morna Abdul Qadir Raipuri, rahmatullahi. He's from our, he's not from our chain, but he's one of our well-known elders of Dioband. In his seerah book, the seerah about himself, his biography, he talks about how when he was just graduating from the madrasa and he became a scholar of deen, he went out looking for the truth. Very similar to Imam Ghazali rahimahullah was a great scholar, taught the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had thousands of people who loved him and sat around him. And then he had the sudden desire to look for the truth, the divine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he went out. He had a very similar situation. These were the days when a false prophet had emerged on the scene in the Indian subcontinent in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And his fitna had spread like wildfire all around. And to this day, you'll find the followers of this false prophet all over the world, including here in Buffalo, we have his followers here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us against them. He said, I came to his city, his village where he lived, this false prophet. His first Khalifa, who became his Khalifa after he died, I sat in his gathering. And I don't know why I knew the deen, I have the Quran and Sunnah, I have the knowledge, but something, and, and, and it was, I had the knowledge of deen knowing that this is all false. But there was something about these people that I was so attracted to him. Every little while he would say, La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al And he said, whenever he would say that, I'd feel a pull on my heart. I'd feel this pull on my heart. And then he would recite this again, every few minutes or every little while, he would recite this, and I'd feel this pull coming on my heart. I couldn't understand why I felt like this was the truth. This is the truth. This is Islam. Had it not been for the fact that I had already met my future sheikh before I had come here, I would have turned away from Islam. I had met my sheikh and I had seen his face and I, his face illuminated like the full moon and I had seen him for a few days, how he lived his life, his ibadah, his following and adherence to the sunnah of Rasulullah and I knew that this can't be anybody but a true wali of Allah. He said, whenever these waswasas and thoughts came to my mind when I was sitting in the gathering of this person, this khalifa, of this false prophet, I would always be the face of that my shaykh would come in front of me. My future shaykh. He had not made bay'ah with him yet. But his face would come in front of me and the whispers would go away. Then again he would say, La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al And again I'd feel the pull. I feel like I just should just go and accept. And then again, I would get the shaykh coming in front of me and it would go away. Eventually, he left it. He left the gathering and he went back to his shaykh. He made bear with him. After many years with his shaykh, he finally asked him the question. He said, Shaykh, you know, before I made bear to you, I came to you, I met you, and then I went on ahead. And I sat in the gathering of these people. And whenever he used to recite this ayah of Quran Hakim, I just felt like he had me in his grip. I don't understand why. Why was it? Why was I getting this feeling? He recited this ayah of Quran Hakim, the Sheikh. He was actually sitting against the wall, and when he asked this question, the Sheikh pulled up against the wall from away from the wall and he said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recited an ayah of Qur'an-i-Hakim 
الله سبحانه وتعالى سيد لنا آية في القرآن الحكيم ومن يشاقق الرسول من بعد ما تبين له الهدى ويتبع غير سبيل المؤمنين نوله ما تولى ونصله جهنم Those who oppose Allah and his Rasul After they have been guidance, given guidance by Allah ويتبع غير سبيل المؤمنين And they follow a path Away from the path of the believers they start doing their own things. We give him over to himself. And then we throw him into the hellfire. We give him over to himself, meaning that he's in the hands of his nafs and he's now in the hands of shaitan. And he's given that power of to do istidraj. And therefore our elders always tell us Stay away from such people Same order Rasulullah gave about Dajjal Stay away from Dajjal Don't When you hear about his coming Don't come in front of him To talk to him and want to know him Or see curious to find out what he's like When he find out about him This is This means that you need to start running away The opposite way And go away from him Nowadays we see people are very interested when you talk about Dajjal, they want to know what's about, I want to know more about him and what else. But they don't ask out of fear of him, they ask out of curiosity, out of almost like it's a form of entertainment. It was very, very dangerous. I could almost see such a person just when Dajjal comes and he would just run to him and say, okay, let me see what it's all about. But it's not a joke. It's something that we should be fearful of that this is a person who can steal our iman away from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen people to defend Islam against such people, but it's not the job of just anybody to go and just talk to uh, and you know, confront these type of people who are the children of Dajjal. People who make false claims to prophethood are called are called Dajjal in the hadith as well. I've mentioned this before. And they have the same characteristics as him, have the same ability and power to spellbind people and pull people towards himself. I remember once I was reading a book. These were in the days when Mu Ibrahim was here and he had told me to do some research, do, to do some research on this person that we're talking about, this false prophet who came out in the Indian subcontinent. I remember when I read, started reading his book, um, I had the book in my hand, I was reading in the library, I was all alone, and suddenly I felt like a darkness come over my heart. And I had, I was eating uh, gum at that time. And when I, that felt, feeling swept over me, I thought first it's just, I'm not thinking right. Something is just, you know, it's just a waswasa. But as I kept on reading, it kept on getting worse and worse and worse until I felt like vomiting and it became physical. I threw the gum out of my mouth and I ran out and I ran to my sheikh and I said, this is what's happened. He said, don't touch the book. He said, don't even get close to that stuff. And he said, you go, it's good you came to me in time. Otherwise, you, you don't know what could have happened. So the darkness even comes out from their books. The darkness even comes out from their books. It's very, very dangerous stuff. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us against this. So now, Firoz al Delimi, he was a person who slayed this Aswad al Anasi. Can you imagine the amount of Iman he must have had to come into his presence and talk to him and do whatever he needed to finally fulfill his mission? It takes a lot of strength of Iman. Because it's very easy to slip at these type of moments. That's why Rasulullah said, Qatalahu al Abd al Salih, a very pious man killed him. A very, very pious. To put up with the type of magic that they do. So as I was saying, Aswad al Anasi, he was a he was a magician, and it's known that he had shaitan around him all the time. One on his right and one on his left. There was a person named Qais who had teamed up with Firoz and others to assassinate him, to kill him. And 
when Qais came to Aswad al-Anasi and he was the general, the commander-in-chief of his armies. But he accepted Islam and he decided to uh, be a part of the whole mission to kill him. When he came into his gathering, the shaitan was speaking to Aswad al-Anasi and telling him that Qais, this person in front of you, he's amongst the Ahl al-Ghadr, the one who wants to do, he wants to deceive you. Don't listen to what he says right now. And people could hear the shaitan speaking. So Qais was very fearful because now, the shaitan speaking, telling him his whole plans about what he had, the plans that he had in his mind of what he was going to do with him. So when he came in, he was very scared, but he really used some really sweet words and he got out of it. But the shaitan was speaking to us and telling him that he's from the Ahl Ghadr. Be watch out, watch, be watch, careful of him. He has plans to kill you. Also, he had, it's not, he used to call them, they had two names for him, either Dhal Himar or Dhal Khimar. Dhal Khimar because he always was hooded. He always kept a hood on him. So you couldn't see his face. And also, some say that his name was Dhal Himar as well. The, the, the donkey. The one who, who has the donkey. Or the donkey one. Because he had a donkey or a mule that he, whenever he gave it the order, he would go on, down into sajda to him. He would just go like this, and the donkey would go down in sajda towards him. So they used to call him Dhal Himar, the man of the donkey. And also, he was always hooded, so Dhal Khimar, very dangerous man. And as I mentioned, anybody who was in his company, they would become, uh, accept him right away. When he came into Yemen, he took over right away. The Ummal, the governors who had been placed there by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Musa Ashari was one of them, Ma'ad ibn Jabal was another, they ran out of the area. He killed the leader of the Abna, whose name was Shahar. His wife, her name was Marzabana. He forcefully married her because she was very, very, it's said in the narrations that she was very, very pretty. So he killed the governor and then he married her. But she didn't like him, she hated him. So Firoz Delmi, Jadwe, and Jashnas, these are three people who were the main team that ended up killing Firoz Delmi. It's a very long story, but they conspired with Marzabana, and Firoz came to her and he said to her that, Look, this man, he's the killer of your husband. Is there. What kind of feelings do you have about him? She, he wanted to make sure that she was on their side. She said, you know, what do you plan on doing? He said, we want to get him out of here. He said, or do you want to kill him? So she was even happy to kill him. She said, of course, if, that, if we could do that, that would be even better. She said, no problem. He said, there's no way you can get to him. There's no way you can get to him because he always has guards around him. Even at night, Around his room, there's guards all the time. But there's an alleyway that leads to a back room. If you can dig underneath the wall, I can help you get to him, and we can work. From there, we can get the job done. So she showed them the way, and Firoz Delmi, Jazwe, and Jishnas, these three people, they dug the whole night underneath the wall, and they slipped in. Firoz al says that when he went inside the room where he was staying, he had this weird type of sound was coming out of him. He was talking this very weird talk that I was so fearful at that time. I was really scared. He said, I went straight up to him. It was very dark. And I hit him on the neck really hard. He fell. And this sound became louder. He said, I didn't feel like doing anything on my own, so I ran to go call the other two. His wife said, where are you going? Are you going to leave him alone? Now he's going to kill me if he finds out, because now he knows I'm a part of the plan. He said, no, no, I'm going to come back. 
So he called these two and then they killed him. At the time when they were killing him, this strange type of scream came out from his body. Release, like a, such a horrifying sound. He said, I've never heard anything like that before, before or after. And it was so loud that it shook up the whole room and people who were outside, the guards, they heard it. And they were, they asked, what's going on? Mahada, Mahada, what is the sound, what is the sound? So the wife said, oh, he's receiving revelation. He's receiving revelation. They killed him and then after that, the news reached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the rest of the story is very long. But the point is that it was Firoz al-Dalimi radiallahu ta'ala anhu who actually ended up killing him. And because of that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him al-Abd al-Salih. And therefore, he holds also a very high place, just like Wahshi ibn Harb, in that he was a slayer of one false prophet and he was a slayer of the other false prophet. And it's also known that he came back to Medina Munawwara in the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu used to call him Rajul Mubarak, very blessed man. He's a very blessed man, he's a very blessed man. But he never stayed in Medina Munawwara, he only came as a delegation with a few people from the Abna and then they returned back to Yemen and then he came in the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab again. Then he went back and then he passed away in Yemen um, and that is where his grave is during the Khilafah of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So this is a brief story of Firoz al-Dalimi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us and protect us against the evils of the Dajjalin and make us like the Sahaba Ridwan Allah like Firoz al-Dalimi radiallahu anhu. Bless us with the iman that he had to defend the deen and protect the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since this is inshallah going to be the first night of the last 10 nights of Ramadan, there's a few things that I want to go over with the brothers who are going to be here with, in Itikaf and also for those who are not going to be here for Itikaf and I think this is beneficial also for those uh, who are online and of course are not going to be in Itikaf at all um, because it's important for us to know the importance of these last 10 nights and what we need to do to benefit and maximize our time in these last 10 days. It's mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Aisha Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anha said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would perform a lot of ibadah in the first 20 days of Ramadan, but nothing compared to his last 10 days. His last 10 days, nothing compared to it. The way he exerted himself in doing ibadat and doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he wouldn't even spend a, a moment talking to anyone. He was just doing dhikr and ibadat the whole day, all those days in the last 10 days for itikaf. So, we also need to maximize on this time, these last 10 days, make the most out of it that we can, knowing especially that the odd nights are, could be, any one of them could be the night of the power, the night of Qadr. And those of us who are not in itikaf, if we can spend every odd night here in the masjid, just doing ibadah. Who knows if it's a night of Qadr, we get the reward of a thousand months, inshallah. Especially considering the fact that our Taraweeh finishes at like 11.45, 11.50, and the Suhoor is at like 3, uh, finishes at 4 o'clock. So there's not, the night is very, very short. One can um, do very little ibadah, and get so much reward of a thousand months. So staying just in the masjid for four hours, just for three hours, four hours, doing ibadah in the odd nights, you can get the reward of a thousand months. We should all make an intention to do this. Of course, in order to make the itikaf in this masjid successful and to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in devoting ourselves completely to ibadah, it's very important to have a good environment. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would go into ibadah in the last 10 days, no one was talking to each other. There was many sahaba sitting 
in i'tikaf with Rasulullah Sallallahu in the masjid, but everybody was in their own tent. Everyone had their own tent. And they would go into their own tent and they would just do the ibadah. Rasulullah Sallallahu was doing ibadah in his own tent. There was no gatherings where they were having ta'aleem or anything like we have. We do this because if we don't, then we would waste our time talking. We don't have that level of deen and iman that we would spend all our time doing the dhikr. So we have these extra things just to keep us connected to the masjid. These talks that we have, the ta'aleem that we have. Right? Otherwise, in reality, all this time is supposed to be only in ibadah. So it was a very beautiful environment that Rasulullah had made in the masjid that everybody was just doing ibadah non-stop. And if we can't do that, the least that we can do is at least create an environment where anybody who comes into the masjid, they feel like they want to do some form of ibadah and also want to contribute into making this a very blessed environment. For that, there's a couple of rules that we've made here in order to, inshallah, protect the good environment and make sure that there's a good atmosphere here for doing ibadah and dhikr of Allah and that encourages other people who come here to also do ibadah and the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One thing is, of course, very basic that we don't want anyone talking as much as possible. Um, where it's necessary, we will talk. Where it's not necessary, we should not be talking at all. For those brothers who are in i'tikaf, very quickly go over the boundaries of the masjid. On this side, the boundaries of the masjid are at the first step of the stage. So if you're sitting on, if you're on the first step of the stage, you are actually in, outside the masjid. And on this side, you can see now, alhamdulillah, Tamir and them had put a black tape throughout. That black tape is, um, tells, it, it demarcates the boundaries on this side of the masjid. For those of us who are sitting in Irtikaf, we can't leave that boundary except for two reasons. Either we're eating or drinking or going to the bathroom and that's it. And what that means is that when we go upstairs to eat or we go to the bathroom, if anyone stops us in the way to talk about something, we have to completely ignore them. As if they don't even exist. And when we come to sit and eat, we just have to eat and we have to go. Because if we talk, we broke our itikaf. Talking meaning starting a whole discussion. If, for example, there's a plate of some food that you want to get and you say, brother, can you pass? That's a different thing but making, making a whole discussion and spending extra time, that's going to break the itikaf. So that's one thing we who are going to be doing itikaf should be very, very, very careful about. Okay. As for those brothers who are not in itikaf, who are going to also be joining us, we ask them also to assist in creating a very quiet environment where there's no talking, everybody's just focusing themselves on what they're supposed to be doing. That's it, just eating and going, coming back to the masjid and doing their ibadah. So having a whole festival or a fair where everybody's just talking, we don't want that type of environment here in the masjid. It's not good. Especially when it's here in the balcony where everyone can hear too. Imagine people are doing dhikr and ibadah here and people are talking over there and you can hear it so clearly. It has an effect on the people who are doing ibadah. Right? And destroys the environment. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. We want to come to eat, bismillah. We invite everyone, but we don't want um, anybody doing any talking. Jazakumullah khair for that. Number two, maximizing our time, doing ibadah as much as possible. You can even set up a time of what you, exactly you want to do in your ibadah. I was asking some of the brothers, what are your plans for ibadah? What exactly do you plan on doing? So alhamdulillah, some of them gave me a list of what they want to do. Alhamdulillah, and that's really the way to get things done because if you just say, I'm going to do ibadah, but you have nothing set up, then you really end up doing nothing. Until you don't pin yourself down, okay, I'm going to do this at this time, I'm going to do this at this time, I'm going to do this at this time. Certain things we'll be doing together. For those of us in Tagaf, those things that we're going to be doing collectively, everybody has to join that. 
For example, we'll have the ta'leems, we have this gathering here after Asr, and then we have the dhikr gathering and the khatam that's after Dhuhr. All the brothers who are going to be sitting at Takaf, and we ask the others who are not in Takaf to also join that, but the brothers who are in Takaf ha- should be joining that. And those who will not be or be sleeping or laying down, then we're going to ask them to please come and join the gathering, inshallah. We'll have one ta'leem from 12 to 1, and then we'll have this gathering at, after Asr. Between that time, from Dhuhr to Asr, that time is free for all forms of different ibadah that you want to do. You want to sleep, you can sleep as much as you want. Bismillah. Dream, dream as much as you want. Bismillah. No problem. As long as there's no talking. That's the main rule. You sleep as much as you want. Snore as much as you want. Dream as much as you want. Then we have one ta'lim that will be held right after the taraweeh is complete. Taraweeh is finished. After that, we'll have one ta'lim that will be about 25, 20, 30 minutes, depending on the day. We will also ask all the brothers from the non who are not in Etikaf to please attend that gathering as well. We'll always choose very, very good books that are very effective in changing our way of thinking, changing our lives around, so that books of our elders, so that it it helps encourage us to do more ibadah, especially in these 10 nights, and change our way of life. Right now we're reading Fadal al-Sadaqat uh, in the morning. We're reading Mashaykh al We'll be changing that book though, inshallah. So if the brothers who are not in Yatakaf can also join those gatherings, that would be very good. These gatherings are very special gatherings. These are gatherings that are attended by angels. The rahmat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon these gatherings. So don't think it's not, you know, uh, it's not for me or I've got other things to do. If you can, please attend these gatherings. There's a lot of rahmat, a lot of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on these. And those who join it, who knows if it's a time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is granting forgiveness, we may all begin forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time. For food and drink, as I mentioned, all the food and drink will be taking place, will be on the balcony. The arrangements are made for that on the balcony. Those who want to uh, bring their food and drink out into the masjid, that's not allowed. Of course, when you're going to bring your food and drink in the masjid, that also will start discussion sometimes. You know, you have a little bit of food in your hand and somebody else comes before and you sit down together and you start talking and then you're eating at the same time. We don't want that to happen. Keep the food and drink on the balcony. Please don't bring it inside the masjid. Of course, the masjid is only for ibadah anyways. That's the whole purpose and um, objective of a masjid. So eating and drinking, we should not be doing that in the masjid at all. Another thing, very important, is cell phones. This should have, I should have mentioned this when we were talking about the subject of talking. But cell phones is more dangerous than talking itself because talking is not addictive, cell phones are. We like to check our cell phones, we want to see what's going on, this and that. Right? If we can, the best thing is to leave our cell phones behind as I've left my cell phone behind in my house. Right? I ask the brothers if they can leave their cell phones behind. If they can't leave it behind, they have to bring it inside. Then bring it inside, but please don't use it inside the masjid. Please don't use it inside the masjid. Or if you have it for recitation of Qur'an and Hakim, that's Bismillah. You're, you have the those digital Qur'ans on your cell phone, that's no problem. Still it's preferable that you use the physical copies of the Qur'an and Hakim because this will always be an excuse to get into other things as well. Sometimes you say, okay, let me just flip through one thing, check something out. All right. Our nafs is very dangerous, this thing inside of us. So keeping away from the cell phone as much as possible. Generally speaking, most forms of technology are just a, just a curse. Curse for our deen, really. They're no good. They benefit a lot, but they don't bring any good to our deen. Right? They bring more harm than they bring good. So, any type of cell phones and any other type of thing that we have, this includes um, the, uses, the use of alarms. If you want somebody to wake you up, um, you can ask one of the brothers who, the organizers, they can, inshallah, wake you up. Or if anybody else who you know stays awake at night that you want you to wake you up, that you can ask them, they will wake you up. But if you put an alarm on and there's other people sleeping and you don't wake up, and that happens a lot too, that you put an alarm on for yourself, you're still snoring away and there's other people who are sleeping and they get waken up by it. 
So that's not permissible because, of course, that's putting other people in discomfort and putting others in discomfort, hurting other people um, and not fulfilling their rights is a cause of sin. And, of course, we're coming here to do ibadah, not to, uh, to commit sins here in the masjid. Right? We have to look out for the rights of Allah. We have to look at the rights of those who are around us as well. That's very, very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive his rights. People may or may not forgive their rights. Especially, there's another thing um, that I remember is that sometimes we talk and we talk so loud that people are sleeping wake up. Right? So we're not going to talk in the first place, alhamdulillah. That's something we, we all made a vow that we're not going to talk. But there's others sometimes that come. Other people come inside the masjid and they don't know if we see them, they're talking. And we should tell them that, brothers, you know, there's people sleeping, there's people doing their ibadah. If you can please, you want to do your talking, you can do it outside the masjid. There's a lot of place to do talking outside the masjid. The whole dunya around here is a place for talking. Keep the masjid just for ibadah. So, avoiding alarms if you can. And of course, cell phones completely. If you're going to recite Quran Hakim, don't recite it loudly, recite it quietly so that other people are not disturbed. Of course, if there's a collective amal going on, for example, the dhikr of Allah is going on and you're not part of the gathering and that you don't do dhikr, you haven't been prescribed any dhikr by Shaykh and you want to recite Quran loudly at the time, Bismillah, there's no harm in that because everybody's doing their dhikr loudly so it wouldn't make any difference. But if people are sleeping, somebody's laying down, somebody's doing some other form of ibadah and you're doing reciting Quran really loudly, it's going to cause disturbance to others. Right? And instead of being, bringing uh, reward, it may bring sin. We're going to turn the lights off right after the ta'aleem, after taraweeh. But tahajjud will be going on throughout and there's inshallah. I, I, I pray my tahajjud um, and there's some brothers who stand behind us. If there's anyone who wants to join us in tahajjud, that's fine. If you want to pray tahajjud on your own, Bismillah, and you want to do it loudly, that's okay as well. We prefer that people do not sleep at night, that they do their ibadah, pray their tahajjud, you want to pray your tahajjud, you want to recite your Quran and Hakim. Um, there will be, though the lights will be off, we'll have lamps throughout here in the front of the masjid so that you can turn those lights on and recite Quran and Hakim. And if it turns out that everyone is awake and everyone is doing ibadah, because of which we don't have enough lamps, we'll just turn the lights back on. Right? What's the point of keeping the lights off? For who? So we just turn the lights on and then everybody, those who are praying tahajjud, pray the tahajjud. Those who want to recite Quran, you can recite Quran. Anyone, anything else you want to do? Any other ibadah you want to do, you can do that as well. Well, that will be all based on how we see things, how things happen, inshallah. If there's everyone who's staying awake, inshallah, and hopefully that's the case, then there's no need to turn off the lights. But in the beginning, we will just to see how things work out, inshallah. I think I've basically gone over everything, right? Alhamdulillah. For those people who are in the houses, our sisters, it was the habit of the Azwaj Mutaharat, the wives of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Sahabiyat, Ridwanullah Alaihi Najma'in, that they always would designate a certain part of their house, a certain room, just for ibadah for themselves. And that would become their mu'takaf, the place where they perform their i'takaf. They wouldn't come to the masjid, especially um, after Rasulullah specifically warned certain sahabiyat that it's better for them to pray and do their ibadat in their home. There was a sahabiya named Ummi Hamid al-Sa'adi radiallahu ta'ala anha. She wanted to pray behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, Rasulullah sallallahu she came to Rasulullah sallallahu and asked him, Ya Rasulullah, I want to pray salah behind you. I would enjoy it. He says, I know you would enjoy it, but it's better for you to pray in your home. And in your home, pray in the place that's the furthest away from any man. And he mentioned, it's a very long hadith in which he mentioned an enclosed place within that another enclosed place 
within that another enclosed place. So the most enclosed place that you can have in your house is where a woman should be praying her salah. Doesn't have to, but the point is that we, for women, it's best that they perform their ibadat in their houses and uh, make a place where they can do their ertikaf, like Rasulullah told Umm Hamid that you demarcate a certain place in your house where you do your ertikaf. For those sisters who want to come for tarawih, bismillah, that's permissible, there's, not, there's no hurma. But even for them, when they go back home, what are they going to do? They're taking care of their children. Sometimes they have a little bit of time for ibadah. They should have a certain place in their house where they can go and just do their ibadah at that time. Especially the time between Asr and Maghrib should be a time for dua. This is usually a time when our sisters are doing the cooking and Allah, they're very busy in the kitchen. But there should be a certain period of time between Asr and Maghrib, even if it's for 20 minutes, that they're just doing dua because it's a time of acceptance of dua in that mu'atakaf, right? So as soon as they go in the mu'atakaf, they make the intention, I'm going in i'tikaf, and when they come out, they mm, come out of the i'tikaf. So all sisters should be, should try to do this in following and adherence to the ways of the azwaj al-muttaharat and the sahabiyat in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, making a place of i'tikaf for ourselves. Now, outside of the time that we're busy with our kids, we have a little bit of time, we go here instead of going to our room. Right. Okay, the question is, well, it depends on if this is a sister or, or a brother. The question is about a person, uh, can a person do it, uh, a sh can a person take a shower in i'tikaf? Okay, um, a brother taking a shower in i'tikaf? No, because shower is not fard. Yes, going to the bathroom, that's something you have to leave the i'tikaf for. Eating and drinking, this is something that's necessary. Shower is not necessary. Even the juma, sh shower for juma, that's a sunnah, it's not a fard. So, take a shower right now, if you plan to your i'tikaf. Right. Just remember, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were in Arabia and it was much hotter than here. It was much, much, much hotter than here. And they spent those last 10 days only coming out of the masjid when they had to go to the bathroom, when they had to eat or drink. Besides that, they never went out. So we're living here in a colder climate where we shouldn't have such an issue. And plus we have antiperspirants and all that kind of stuff too nowadays. So Tonight is not the 20th night. Tonight is the 21st night. Tonight is the 21st night. After Maghrib is the 21st, which means tonight could be the night of Qadr. This is the night of Ibadah. And then two days later, we'll have the 23rd, two days after that, 25th, and then 27th and 29th. It's very famous, 27th is the night of Qadr, but in reality, the night of Qadr is not even specified. The only thing we know is that it's in the odd nights of, Ramad, of the last 10 days of Ramadan. That's it. So it could be on the 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, and 29th. It's famous because there's some Sahaba who held that opinion that it was on the 27th. But this wasn't a consensus the way we make it like a consensus. You see everybody coming on 27th, and then what about the 23rd and 25th and 21st? And some scholars hold the opinion that it changes every single year. So one, one year it may be on the 21st, the next year it may be on the 23rd, the next year it may be on the 29th. And the year after that, it will be on the 25th. The point is, spend every single odd night in ibadah. If you get tired from ibadah, go to sleep. Wake up again another hour, come back and do ibadah again. Dua, making dua, there's a time of acceptance of dua. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Aisha Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anha asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, if the night of power, the night of qadr comes, what should I do? What kind of dua can I do? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught her dua. Very beautiful dua, that you just recite this dua. And this dua will suffice for all duas. What is that dua? Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afa fa'afuanna. Allah, you are forgiving. You love forgiveness. Forgive us. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afa fa'afuanna. So he specially taught this dua just for the night of Qadr. Just for the night of Qadr. 
So, so every, that doesn't mean that if, if it's uh, only the night of Qadr, then you should recite it, and then uh, every, on the 22nd or the 24th, you should skip it. The point is that you do more of this on the odd nights, but you should do it on the even nights as well. Allahumma inna ka afoon tahibbul arfa farfu an naif. Anyone doesn't know it, inshallah, I can write it out for you and hand it out, inshallah, later on. He's asking about Firoz al Dalimi radiallahu ta'ala, and that he only two, three narrations. Obviously, because he only spent very little time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And actually, now that I think of it, there's one other thing that I remembered. One of his narrations, Jazakallah for reminding me. He had two wives. Firoz al Dalimi radiallahu ta'ala had two wives, and they were both sisters. They were both sisters. So he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After accepting Islam, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm married to two women and both of them are sisters. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you have to give talaq to one of them because you can't be married to two sisters. In fact, you can't even be married to a niece and her aunt. It's not allowed in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very clear in the eyes of Quran and Hakim in Surah Nisa. So, the Firoz al Dalimi is one of his most famous narrations is this that he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked Rasulullah, I have married two women, both of them are sisters. What's the hukum? Waliya ukhtan, I have two sisters and I'm, that I'm married to. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, You have to give talaq to one of them. There's, different, there's always conflicting opinions about death because in those days, you have to remember, there is no such thing as rec- recording of the date of birth and the date of death. There is no such thing. Right. Nowadays, there's a whole system. You know exactly when you're born and the day of your death is also recorded because you have birth certificates, you have death certificates, which you need for just about everything. You want to get your passport, you have to give your birth certificate. Not your death certificate, just your birth certificate. For all important documentations, you need your birth certificate. So this is, in this system, it's very, very necessary. In the olden times, even a hundred years back, there was no concept of, you know, knowing the date of your the birth and the date of death. It just wasn't known. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is not known. The most important person in this world, we don't know the date that he was born. We know roundabout. Okay, it was somewhere near the year of the elephant. We know this much. So you go to the Sita books and you see every Sita book has a different uh, opinion. One will say on this date, one will say on this date, one will say on another date. Same thing with the date of his death. There's like seven, eight opinion, opinions. One says the 8th, one says the 11th, one says the 12th, one says uh, the 17th, one says the 18th, one says the 8th. People celebrate the date of his birth as the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. But in reality, we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure if he was really born on that date or not. So, because of that, there's always conflicting opinions about when he actually passed away. So, um, regarding all the shining stars we have, we have conflicting opinions about their date of their death. So there may be one narration that I, I read one narration that said a Khilafat of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala there probably when I was writing this there was another narration that passed by me that said the Khilafat of Amir Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala. But the point is that he did pass away. <laughs>